The Sharp Edge on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Mazic Seeds. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to The Sharp Edge. Today, we are down in Molesworth, Ontario. Of course, I'm catching up with Greg Stewart, Mazic's agronomist. Sir, how's it going? Hey, Bern. Beautiful June day. Today, we have two people, two interviews on The Sharp Edge. Tyler Cronin and Dr. Jocelyn Smith, and we're going to talk about corn rootworm resistance. Now, Greg, why are Tyler and Jocelyn on the sharp edge? Right. Tyler Cronin, Cronin Family Farms, up here in this area near uh, Molesworth. Uh, so big hog operators, right? Lots of corn, lots of corn on corn, a system that really works well for them. And then Dr. Jocelyn Smith, research scientist, Ridgetown College, University of Guelph, some real concerns about the development of rootworm resistance to the traits that have been providing protection, right? And so they bring some interesting perspectives as to the cause and maybe the solution of rootworm resistance. And the sharp edge is nematodes. The nematode idea is really cool. So in these projects that we're going to talk about today and that Jocelyn Smith is leading, has this idea of applying nematodes that will in fact feed on the rootworm larvae and provide sort of a biological protection against the damage that the uh, rootworms would do. Awesome. Let's kick it off with Tyler Cronin. Hey Tyler, thanks for joining us on the Sharp Edge. So tell us a little bit about your operation here near Molesworth, Ontario. Yeah Greg, I'm happy to be here. Uh, basically in the area we have 5200 sows and then we have another uh, 3,000 head nursery uh, just up the road and we grow about 800 acres of corn every year. Right on. So in your rotation, because of all the hogs, it's corn after corn after corn. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, basically, we uh, value the nutrients in the manure a lot more than a lot of other people do. So selling it isn't worth it as much for us. And uh, just being able to use that nutrients in the corn every year, it's one of the crops that uses it the best and the corn goes right back into our silos or grain banking uh, and then all our corn gets fed right. right back to the pigs. So the important rotation for you, if we could use that word, would be corn, hogs, manure, corn, hogs, manure, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Uh, for us, that corn's the best uh, crop for the pigs and for the utilization of Right. Uh, manure in our operation. So obviously you're aware of the concern about rootworm resistance to the, uh, to the traded corn that you're obviously using to keep control of the rootworm pressure. Where's, uh, where's your head at in terms of concern about rootworm resistance developing? Yeah, for us it's, it's definitely uh, something we have to worry about uh, growing corn on corn. Uh, rootworm can be pretty devastating and uh, so uh, we're definitely, we have, we work with our local uh, co-op and they come out and they, they're looking for rootworm in the spring and then we're counting population in the fall and we do move some fields out of corn if there is a bad population in the fall and we'll do two years of uh, like a bean wheat rotation if we have to. So if you go out in this field, say behind us, this fall you will scout for adults and if you find a lot of rootworm adults you will pull it out of corn for a couple of years. If we had to, we if would. If you had yeah. to, yeah. yeah. Hey, that's cool. So we uh, we appreciate your being uh, sort of one of our sites here for doing some uh, rootworm research. We've got you know a smart stack, a, a traded hybrid, an untraded hybrid. We use the high rate seed treatment. We use force in furrow, and of course, one of the other things that we're looking at is uh, is these nematodes that might control uh, rootworms in a continuous corn situation. Uh, what, uh, what feelings have you had about being able to move to some sort of biological control for rootworm? I think it's definitely uh, something we're willing to look at. We're willing to look at anything that'll help us run smoothly in the future and if it comes at the right price, we're definitely willing to look at it further. Hey Jocelyn, thanks for joining us on the Sharp Edge today. I guess our first question is, give us a bit of an overview of where the corn rootworm resistance stands in the broad picture in North America wide and then even down into here, local Ontario. Sure, Greg. Yep, rootworm always keeps us guessing, right? I mean, we thought we had a really good, well, we do have really good tools with the transgenic traits for rootworms. Um, they've been around since about 2003 
in the US and Canada, and it was around 2009 in the US that we started to see some issues with resistance. Um, to the original oldest trait from uh, Monsanto at the time, that one kind of went first, but since then we really have seen it develop to all three and four now of the different uh, BT events for rootworm control in the corn belt of the US. There's issues in Nebraska, Iowa, you know, the big corn states. And in Canada, we've been keeping a close eye on it too, um, doing some monitoring over the years. And our first um, issue happened around 2012, to be honest. It's been 10 years now that we had right. our first uh, case. Um, but since then, we've just had the odd, like here and there, little pockets where we've heard of issues starting up. Um, but in the last two or three years, I'd say it's kind of ramped up a lot in a lot to a faster pace. Right. And um, it seems to be, well, obviously, it's always associated with continuous corn production. And so in Ontario and, and Quebec, we're starting to get rumors as well, where we've got lots of livestock production in those counties. That's where we seem to have the biggest issues happening. But that's not to say it's not happening in just grain corn producer systems as well, who do a lot of continuous corn. In these plots that we're doing this year, we have an untraded hybrid. We have that untraded hybrid with a high rate seed treatment. Mm -hmm. We've got in furrow insecticide, force, and of course we have our traded hybrid. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of giving some exposure to the rootworm possible resistance through you know, different possible options that a grower might use. But I think the interesting component, at least the part that interested me the most, was this idea of nematodes yeah. that we could bring in. And we've done that on these sites. We've applied the nematodes a year ago, and that these nematodes might actually provide some biological control against the rootworm. Talk to us a little bit about this whole nematode idea. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and you're right. So those other options that we've had in the past for root room control like the high rate seed treatments they're pretty much gone right. after this year yep. we don't have that as an option we still have force uh, granular insecticide as an option but very few people have the equipment to use that so we have traits and we need something that can maybe supplement that now or extend their life a little longer so this uh, researcher at the university at cornell university in new york state dr elson shields he was looking at these nematodes to control alfalfa snout beetle in in New York State and Eastern Ontario. Right. Like a soil dwelling larval stage that these nematodes would attack and it worked fantastically. He just happened to notice in some of those New York fields, dairy producers, lots of continuous corn, that he was getting rootworm control as well. So they've now inoculated like tens of thousands of acres in New York and it's and they're showing persistence of these nematodes for like they're up to seven years now where they're still seeing efficacy against corn rootworm in those fields. On top of the traits, it's a really good method and they're seeing maybe fifth, anywhere from 50 to 90% less rootworm injury in those fields with the nematodes where they're applied. So we wanna see if this is gonna work as well in Ontario. There's really no reason it shouldn't. We're very similar conditions. So we're optimistic that this is a new tool that we can add to to prolong the traits in Ontario. Right, and our application technology really isn't too sophisticated here. No. It's essentially a sprayer. We did it with our backpack sprayer on yeah. some of the sm small sites yeah. and just 50 gallons of water mixed with the nematodes yep. uh, that get flushed out of sort of a sawdust type material that they come in mm -hmm. and then take away the strainers, take away the tips, take away the filters yep. and uh, essentially flood on 50 gallons of water with the nematodes yeah. uh, into the crop. We did it about this stage uh, right. last year. Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, and so talk to us if you know, do how is one year enough for that nematode population to get established? Yeah. Well, it should be. That's what the, the data from New York has shown. And you know what, they're not just, they've also tried this in a bunch of other states now too. I think Nebraska, Iowa, Pennsylvania, all the way even to Texas and New Mexico, they're having success with this. Same, uh, same research is kind of, it's all branched out from there. But yeah, one time application um, can be done in the spring just in a tank of water, you put it on as you, as you described. Um, they've also had some success applying it in liquid manure. Okay. So applying the nematodes mixed with liquid manure. So that's another good idea. Um, they, I think one of the only cautions that they have is you don't want to put it on under super dry conditions. Uh, the nematodes need some moisture to right. get into the, into the soil and, and get protected. So 
other than that, it is pretty simple. And that one-time application, they're, like I said, they're seeing that they're lasting for about seven years. Right. The, the key here is that these nematodes that they are producing in New York are not the ones that you can just buy commercially right now from a garden supply type thing. Okay. You see those a lot, but those commercial, uh, uh, commercially available nematodes don't seem to have the persistence out in the field that we want. And these nematodes in New York, they isolate from the soil every few years and kind of keep the, pop, the, the rearing colonies strong. And they have better, better traits for being out in the field environment. Right. Yeah. So when we talk to Tyler, he's got a, he's got a, a great operation here. Uh, he talked about scouting for adults yeah. and, then, uh, and then making some adjustments to his continuous corn. Uh, I thought that was a pretty, uh, a pretty nice approach. Your comment on that? Yeah, I think he's got the right idea for sure there. Um, I wish, I've said this a bunch of times, I wish we could have thought that way from the beginning with the rootworm traits. We probably shouldn't have been using them just everywhere all the time in all the hybrids because it was easy to, but if we had maybe used them a little more prescriptively, like you, if in a first year cornfield, there will be no rootworms. Right. So there's no need for a trait there. At the end, or late in the summer, you start scouting for beetles in the field. And if you see on average, like one beetle per plant in late July through August, early September, that's kind of the window when the beetles are around. One beetle per plant of Western corn rootworm, that tells you, you should probably protect next year because they're in there laying eggs in that soil, in that field, and um, they'll be back. They'll hatch out in the spring and be ready to eat those corn plants. But cool. um, yeah, so you can, but if, the, if those levels of beetles are lower than that in the, in the late summer, then you could probably get away without a rootworm trade in the second year. Yep. But they'll, they'll build after a couple of years. So probably third year is when for sure you want some protection. So just finally, Tyler expressed interest in technology that would uh, allow him to continue uh, growing corn after corn. How, uh, how commercially available will these nematodes be for a grower like Tyler? That's a good question. I think it's still early days. There's, we're, we're getting them from New York right now. There's a, 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 a business that kind of started up out of this who's producing them but I know they're looking for more people to produce them. And so maybe we have an opportunity in Ontario to, for somebody to start a nematode business because, uh, yeah, I mean, at, right at this point, it's kind of research stage that we're on that scale that they're available. Right. Um, if we need to treat thousands and thousands of acres, we're going to need some more nematodes. Cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jocelyn, thanks for all your efforts on this particular topic for your research in Ontario and for being with us today. Yeah, thanks. Good to work with you, Greg. All right. <laughs> So there you have it, a great conversation, Greg Here, You know what I heard, you know, it's more than traits. Absolutely, and Tyler acknowledges that when he talked about scouting fields, looking for adult rootworm pressure, and making the decision to pull some of those acres out of a corn on corn rotation and rotate in soybeans to sort of deal with that adult rootworm pressure risk. So that's, that's, that's a good integration of, uh, of approaches. Are nematodes a solution? I think you phrased that correctly, Bern. Nematodes are a solution, or at least part of a solution, right? Uh, I mean, we've got to see what the numbers look like. So far, the work that Jocelyn has done has showed some promise that in fact the nematodes are reducing some of the risk. But I think anyone that's been involved in this rootworm game realizes that you, the minute you have a single solution focus, the rootworm zigs and zags, and, uh, and so you need to integrate. You know, you need, you need to integrate the traits that we're providing in the hybrids. You need to integrate some scouting. What are the adult pressures like? Maybe we can integrate this biological control from nematodes. And let's, let's be realistic. It's probably gonna take all of us working together with a bunch of different possibilities to keep rootworm resistance at bay. Hey, great show, Greg. We will see you next time on The Sharp Edge.